if it isn't the hero of the hour. <laughs> Welcome back. My name is Ash, and I've come from the abyss to talk about something very exciting. A behind the scene video on the next Dragon Age game. If you didn't catch Gamescom the other week, Bioware revealed plenty of shinies, and I'm here to walk you through it step by step. A few notes before we get started. In this video, I will assume you have read Bioware's latest book, To Winter Nights, or at least don't care about getting spoiled. If you haven't read the book yet and desire to do so, it may be best to do that first. Additionally, there will be a link to a separate blog post, which will have the entire transcript available to read if you so desire. And lastly, please watch the original video, link to it is in the description. That all said, prepare yourself, we're jumping in right now. Delivering the introduction is General Manager Casey Hudson, explaining about how they are approaching the next Dragon Age game. All of the concept art, the in-game engine looks, and the in-game footage are meant to express the mood and direction of where they're going. It's important to note, however, that not everything seen in this behind-the-scenes trailer will end up in the final product. Shortly after the delivery of this video at Gamescom, lead writer Patrick Weiss tweeted out an addendum stating that the concept art in the game isn't a complete representation of the final state. They further state that the ones depicted throughout the concept may have been, quote, cut or changed significantly or were never intended to be major characters to begin with. There are major characters who didn't exist yet when the pieces were made. So while the promise of all this footage is extremely exciting, there's no guarantee that any of the following characters seen are our companions, advisors, love interests, or enemies. That all said, we can expect that this game will release after April 2022 as confirmed in one of EA's earning calls. The expectation is that the game will release at any point after that time, but I'd wager it's much safer to say 2023. Antiva. Already the first hint of where we are going in the next Dragon Age, outside of Tevinter. Antiva is located on the northeast of the map, all snug between the Tevinter Imperium and Ravain. The nation is based off Italy, with much of its influence seen in Antiva's architecture. Most notably, the nation holds the most infamous assassins organization known as the Crows, and we will be seeing many of them in this trailer. A golden door in a sea of gray, with a lone dwarf standing in front. The Deep Roads? Or a large door hidden away? Based off the Descent DLC, we confirm the Elven presence in the Deep Roads and the Primordial Tides. While the Dwarves definitely had the capability to have created something like this door, I lean more towards the owners being Elven. Most of the environments, at least back when the Empire was thriving, was best described as minimalistic, yet rich. For instance, if you remove the overgrowth, much of the elements of the Well of Sorrows maintains that golden minimalist design. In this concept, the magical glowing door is an easy take. However, when you take a look at the closer, smaller details, there's little curiosities everywhere. There are small pools of water in the area, the floor lights, the intentional elegant grooves in the wall. The details I'd say lean much more towards elven design. However, if you look at the door, it also looks like less of a door and more like a safe. Is its true purpose to hide secrets or keep secrets at bay? To be determined. More of Antiva. A recurring theme I definitely want to point out is the presence of boats and water in this game. Most of what we did in Inquisition was landlocked. If you step three inches too deep into water, it respawns you right back on the ground. I'm compelled to believe that the game may offer us different mechanics related to water travel, combat, and even transportation. Now, I know you might not want to hear it, but because of Anthem, yes, that looter shooter Bioware released last year, because of Anthem, we know that Bioware has the tech to include swimming. We weren't even able to jump in Dragon Age until Inquisition. Perhaps we can now swim too? Four characters swimming underground, seemingly avoiding attack by archers, as well as pursuing a long-kept treasure chest holding something shiny. As much as I want to cry out Red Lyrium at every turn, the emphasis on this chest piece seems to be that the clasp is shining rather than glowing red. Same with the flatter chest to the skeleton's right. Very anticlimactic, I have to admit. Let's talk about the people here. Despite her very lackluster return in Inquisition through its multiplayer, it's extremely welcome that Isabella would make another appearance in Dragon Age. Especially since we can't have Varric as a companion for a third time, right? Not saying that Isabella would be a companion, as her role post-Inquisition is questionable. Her arc in Dragon Age 2 felt resolved. Hawk already had the opportunity to romance her character, so that's out of the question. 
And even after the possible canon of her sailing around with Alistair and Varric in the comics, it's questionable what she's really doing now. Is she still chasing after Hawk after their trip to Weishaupt? Mourning Hawk's death after their disappearance in the Fade? Relaxing with the Felicima Armada as an admiral? All we do know is that she has years of experience, bears no love for the Kuhn's practices, who will undoubtedly be in an enemy force, and judging by the scene depicted here, still loves her treasures. Dory... Ah, no. Now, as much as I would love to welcome Dorian back into the mix right now, especially since both the comics and Taventer Knights have strongly alluded to our dashing Dorian coming back, I do believe this is a new character. Notice the crow armor on the shoulders, something we've seen in concept art around Saffron. Also, he bears a rapier that's extended on the left side of his body. Dorian's a mage. He doesn't need a sword. And to spoil a little bit of the video ahead of time, there's a concept art that shows a rogue with similar attributes, but using daggers instead. The glowing skeleton. There's not much about this one outside of the glowing green light surrounding their head, the bare-boned face, an interesting headdress, and that they are seen twice in the behind the scenes. The green light is closer to what we see in the clip from what might be the Navarran Grand Necropolis, where spirits generally possess the dead. That said, they'll surely be difficult to bring to parties. Hmm. 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 Now, I'm inclined to believe two things. One, this is actually Sket Harding. The hair, the height, the archery. All signs do point to her and she is still actively with the Inquisition. But option two, this might be Ballara. No, 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 it's okay. That's the good kind of rumble. It's a bit of a stretch, but the line sounds more in character for a dwarf considering the accent. Nonetheless, Bioware revealing her character in this reveal shows that the possibility for either is there, especially as a companion. And at this point, I don't mind either. But at the very least, Bioware, please let us have a dwarf romance in Dragon Age 4. Please. It's got frontier stories, it's got mystery, it's got hard-boiled detective stories. We'll pause here. Mystery, detective stories. The concept piece here looks like a stealthy infiltration about to take place into Venture, either at a magister's home or an official building. While I don't like to talk about leaks, it is also known that Bioware considered or is considering heists as part of the game. It's not for fetch at all to think some of the mechanics may appear in the future, but specifically, who are these people? Outside of the Harding look like we already talked about. Talvashoth, I'm almost certain. Why? It's a Kanari putting on a helmet instead of wearing Vitar, the poison blood armor that Kanari warriors wear. Now, there have been some instances where Kanari wear helmets in past games. However, based on how elaborate Inquisition ended up being with its armor sets, I'm more inclined to believe this one right off the bat is a Talvashoth. The only time you'd see one of the Barisad wearing full armor, as Iron Bolt said once, is because it's war. And well, I think that's a tad bit extreme here. Moving right, have we ever encountered a mage whose outfit looked straight out of a vampire flick? I cannot say, but a fire-centric mage with light hair, an elegant cape, and golden headpiece? Has to be Tevinter. In fact, she looks too similar to someone we might know. Or at least we did. Calpurnia is one of the two paths we can undertake in Inquisition, with former Templar Samson in the other. If you put her hair down, the concept art matches one-to-one. -one. Light hair, pale complexion, elegant headdressing, and a mage. But I'm not convinced it's her, considering players make a conscious decision between the two. It would make sense if the players were forced to choose the Templars, considering that there's the option of letting Copernia go back to Deventer. However, if players choose Samson, she's put on desk duty. But at the same time, she does show up in the comics and has a connection with Marius, who is still active in the series right now. Considering this mage shows up only once in this video, best to put a pin on her for now. The Grey Warden. Or perhaps part of the Inquisition? With the trailer quality, it's really hard to tell, but don't worry. We'll come back to this one. The Anderfels. Or at least it looks apart. If we pull all of the similar concept pieces from this video next to the slide, it's unmistakable that this is a fortress for the Grey Wardens. The blue banners, the wyvern statues, the architecture, the surrounding desert. Although we've only seen pieces of it in arts and in our dreams, 
or more specifically the Fade, what we see here is very close to Weishaupt, the headquarters of the Grey Wardens. The more I see this scene, the more I wonder what Solus's agents would look like. Elven aesthetic trends towards the use of gold, I'd say much more than any other nation or faction. The distinctive pattern on the armor is also difficult to deny. If I were to choose who these people are, I'd say Solus's faction. That said, it makes me wonder who they were fighting against. There's a scene that plays later in the video showing similar bloody clot-like tendrils gravitating on their own. It looks to be a weapon in this shot, so at the very least, we can deduce that Solus isn't at all behind the spread. Not like we thought that was the case in the first place, but there's some comfort thinking that they have to deal with the blight as badly as we do. Now here's where things get a little bit fuzzy. This location should not exist in the current realm. One may think this is Tevinter with the floating rocks and waterfalls about. You normally would only find this elsewhere in the Fade. However, there are telltale signs that this is Elven territory. The architecture on the bottom of the isle floating up top is Elven in nature, as well as the Aravals floating off to the side. The op most obvious clue here, however, is the Hala that is being transported near these ships. These land ships all of a sudden floating in air would cause major alarm among humans. Is it possible that this is an undiscovered area yet to be colonized? Possible, but not very. I'm inclined to believe that this is representative of either the days when Arlathan endured or at the current day crossroads. Navarra, perhaps. Navarra lies at the heart of Thetis with the Menanter River flowing through the nation and Navarra city sitting right next to it. It's home to the Grand Necropolis, a city of their dead, where spirits inhabit the skeletons of that deep city for centuries. The other concept piece in this video shows off these dead, or at least what I believe to be the necropolis, considering that the skeletons are donning gold ceremonial-like accessories. However, it's curious why they're dissecting a newly dead dragon. They place one of its eyes in an instrument as well, while they have different, lesser-ranked skeletons walking off with different body parts, I'd suppose. A path to the deep roads, or at least into the mountain. It's one of the few in-game shots we see in the trailer. It's curious why this area has metal plating on the floor, similar to the old mosaic collection we can collect in Skyhold. Or perhaps similar to the floor puzzles we saw in the Temple of Mothal. By where Sherlock's are floor puzzles, however, so this might be generic. That said, I'm going to pull in some footage that seems to be from the area here. Since we're heading more north, it would normally be a fair estimate that this location is part of Kalshrok, as Dragon Age Inquisition's war table greatly hinted at future involvements with the former capital of the dwarves. However, the statue here is the most telling part that we are still in Orzammar's vicinity. According to the world of Thetis, Kalshrok does not put up massive statues of their paragons like Orzammar does. In fact, the Paragon statue looks identical to a Paragon we've already seen, Hadrian the Deep. Same head, same beard, same pose, same shining collar. The same Paragon whose Taig we visited in the Descent DLC and found an awakened Titan. While it's a little bit of a stretch to say that we're visiting the same ruined Taig again, it seems calculated that Bioware would show this particular shot with in-game footage. We never properly learned the story of what happened to Hadrian, and why his tie not only had a titan, but also countless elven artifacts and massive graveyard of perfectly preserved sarcophagi. Nevertheless, I would be absolutely down to see modern day Orzammar, especially on the Frostbite engine. If not, then I wonder what treasures we'll find in future reveals. We've seen this tree before, but there's more to the area we haven't seen. But for now, no, no romanceable tree for you. After scouring through all the books, I have yet to find something that matches this creature one to one. It looks like a crossbreed between a deep stalker and a dragonling, yet it shares some of the same demented facial attributes as the Red Templars after the corruption starts to settle in. To Vinter in all of its glory. This shot has a lot to digest, so let's start from the left to right. Save the golden clad woman in your memory, we'll get to her towards the end of the video. It's clear this is a scene from Tevinter. The windows and opulently dressed mages are very telling, but the magical hanging lantern is a dead giveaway. Not to mention the woman in the caravan whose shoulder pads scream Tevinter mage. On the left is an Antivan crow wearing the near identical outfit we've seen on Zivran. 
I'd also wager the person at the front is also a crow, judging by the wing cape, dark clothes, and the dagger at the boot. The silver-haired femme canari. Oh, everyone loves her. She is depicted as a dual-wielding rogue later in the trailer and a cart pusher in this shot. Her attire is very typical of what we see in Canari women wear in Inquisition and in the comics, and she looks absolutely gorgeous with long hair that we've been asking Bioware of for years. But that's not the surprising part about her. It's that she is a Canari in Tevinter, a nation that has been at war with the Canari for years. We can already extrapolate the permutations of having her in your party, especially if your character is trying to keep a low profile in a city that normally treats Quinari as slaves. Or sport. It was much easier for the Iron Bull to get away with it because he was a Ben Hasrath and trained to deal with these problems. But considering she's a rogue and a beauty to be sure, it's curious how she plays into the meta when Tevinter hates her kind. And this man, ooh, well, okay. Who's the goof in the mage outfit? Seems undercover to me, even though it does look like the Fenconari is deliberately getting in the mage's space. This reminds me all too well of when Calix Kintara, oh my bad, Calix Skywalker, pretended multiple times to be a magister. He has this same deer in the headlights look on his face. The person only appears once in this trailer, so perhaps we'll come back to him another day. Minrathis, I'd suppose. The city looks absolutely fantastic, and its architecture resembles what we've seen of the city in art. However, we've also seen a similar concept piece that is framed just like this, when the Inquisitor discovers Skyhold. I'd speculate that Manrathis may be a hub we'll visit, or perhaps a base of operations is located inside as well. This piece is called One Moment, as confirmed by art director Matt Rhodes. According to his art station entry, it's a quick image to explore personality. As if the character here, despite being exhausted and up against a massive canary behemoth and tons of dead bodies everywhere, is all, oh, hold on one moment, I need to catch my breath. I'll admit the juxtaposition between the two is quite funny. But it's also a nice slice that will probably likely maybe be fighting against the canary again. Back in Tevinter, there definitely are many signs to determine if you're looking at Tevinter. Number one, magical beings and devices in plain sight. There are extremely few societies that are freely open with the use of magic as much as Tevinter. Number two, mages with exaggerated feathers on their shoulders, especially if it's on a big magister whose feathery outfit is compensating for something. And number three, snakes. Snakes on doors, snakes as pillars, snakes everywhere. The lineup. Now, I have to bring it up again. Patrick Weiss's message. There's no guarantee that any of these characters are actually our companions or our advisors. Matter of fact, considering one of the characters we see in a bit, I'm absolutely sure this is not the complete lineup. But I've provided estimated descriptions on screen for your viewing pleasure. Sadly, all the faces are obscured no matter how much you beloved this image, so these are all speculative. Now this is where it gets interesting. First, a quick run through of these four. The first is who I believed a lot of people called Dorian, yet he is a rogue and using blades instead. The elf to the right wears clothes that somehow remind me of Tevinter, again, most notably some of Dorian's outfits from the waist down. The blue is also very telling, a royal blue rather than the clothes midnight blue to black. And yet I wonder what this weapon even is. There's no blade that we can see, so it's not a pole arm, and it's weird for a staff to be wielded that way. I'm sure we'll see this gent in another time. The center blonde warrior is a crow, little doubt there, and the white-haired Kanari is the same from the previous Tevinter scene, wearing traditional Kanari armor and wielding dual daggers. Now, take a good hard look at these four. And take a good look at these four. And spoilers for later, check a look at these four as well. There's always a leader who is taking point, all from different factions. And there's always three companions. Just like in-game, we can only bring three companions with us. What if this is a clue to our protagonist? Or more specifically, what if this is a clue that hints towards origin stories? The reason why I bring this up is how I got burned the first time, analyzing one of Inquisition's concept art pieces. Originally, I had looked at this piece of concept art way back when, Cassandra, Sarah, and Blackwall. I had initially thought, oh, that's a new rogue character we haven't seen before. But in reality, it wasn't. It was the Inquisitor. 
Now, bear with me, this part is completely speculation. In the past three games, our protagonist's origin stories were greatly tied to two values, our class, warrior, rogue, mage, and our race, human, elf, dwarf, and then later, canary. What if class and race didn't matter anymore? Truly. What if we were able to choose our class and race, but what really mattered was the organization you chose? And this kind of makes sense. The crows have had humans and elves in their organization. Great Warden recruits recruit anyone willing to take joining. The Benhasrath have been all races, and the Lords of Fortune probably don't care just the same. Whether it's as in-depth as Dragon Age Origins intro stories, or simply used for personal role-playing, it'd be an interesting pivot that we haven't seen yet from the series. A shift from everything being about your race, to everything being about who you represent. Inquisition started shifting towards this reality with the Inquisitor being the leader of the Inquisition, but we may see something similar for the future. Just a thought. Smooth transition into a warrior being attacked by a dragon in the background, protecting a woman and child from the flames. The piece was named We Can Be Heroes, and while a dragon is completely troublesome and very, very dangerous, I'd like to point out the giant spider leg that is looming in the background. <sighs> And in Tevin Crow, the most obvious tells are the crows flying next to her, but something more subtle? The rapier in her hand. There are very, 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 very few instances of the rapier being used in the Dragon Age universe. In the Silent Grove, Claudio Velisti used a rapier as his main weapon when fighting Isabella. In Inquisition, the Inquisitor may fight a duel for Josephine's hand while fighting against an Antivan noble named Lord Otranto. In Dragon Age Legends, the only rapier in rotation was deliberately called Antivan Rapier. In summary, she's Antivan, she's a crow, she's an Antivan crow. And it is my personal hope we will have more duels to the death with rapiers or non-traditional swords in the next game. Oh, Solus. Solus, Solus, Solus. Okay. Solus is back and in much different garb than the elegant armor he wore at the end of Trespasser. It's understandable, it was way too much, too gaudy, too loud, too sexy. It's much more preferable for him if he stays low key. He is the trickster god after all. In order to achieve his goals, he will hide in plain sight or wear disguises and speak in a snooty fake Asian accent when necessary. Defender Knights. The emblem he also wears seems to be the new symbol for his faction, as in Defender Knights, one of his agents wore the emblem with simpler garb. Upon inspection, the symbol looks like three different woven heads similar to the Fenharel statues you see around the game, with protruding spheres present in and around the center of the emblem. Sadly, I could not cross-reference this symbol with anything that exists in any of the games, but if you have ever seen this before, please let me know in the comments section below. It's interesting how he is depicted with his own wolf to the side, regardless if this is an artistic choice or not. Flem's animal is a dragon. She was able to shapeshift into one. Solus is a wolf. Can he? Will he in the next game? Those of the Evanuris, the gods of the Pantheon, made laws that restricted the people from becoming specific forms reserved for the gods. Only a few know how to use his power in current day. Flemeth, Morrigan, the Dalish, even the hero of Ferelden given the opportunity. I wonder if we will see Solus using a wolf as an extension of himself. I wonder if we can pet it. I wanted to stop here at the Grey Warden. They don't have a face, but they are a strong contender for being the same Grey Warden from the front cover of Tevinter Knights. He's a shield and sword warrior. His armor, his helmet, his satchels are a near identical match. Considering that the Grey Wardens get the most screen time in this behind the scenes, and Bioware took the time to kind of ram down our throats in tandem with the blighted, nasty bits, it seems fitting that this, this is the guy. This is Davran. Nobody dies on my watch. For the Wardens! Remember when I said there'd be an emphasis on water? Here's another one. A crab-like, kraken face monstrosity fighting a warrior on the beach. I know I keep saying it, but we'll come back to this one. <laughs> I promise. This area is likely in the same area as the original tree everyone wanted to romance. Andraste statue in the background, the moon hanging high, and, oh yes, a creature infused with red larium. But it's not just any character. 
This is likely a darkspawn. It bears the same shape, the same armor, the same weapon, but is much bigger and infused with red larium. Blight magic hasn't clouded the skies here, however, I hope this shot gives you as much anxiety as it does for me. The idea that already powerful hordes of darkspawn eating up red larium makes them significantly more murderous. It's great. Just great. A spider with hands. <laughs> it has hands. It has hands. Okay. Spare me a moment. Bioware, out of all the years I have watched Bioware repeatedly taunt us with spiders and spiders jumping out of crates and descending from the blighted sky and big fear demons that are omega sized tarantulas. What in the actual fuck? bloody organic tendrils follow the bloody sacs I mentioned earlier. It looks like they're alive, but even worse, spreading. And probably the most understated yet alarming part of this entire trailer, the contents of the blighted sacs. In this shot, a mutation rolls around the Grey Warden. This looks like a child. Not a normal child, mind you, but one of the children we saw in Awakening. The unique spawn we have seen come from the mother. The key thing, however, is that the mother is dead. We killed her, as the warden, and it was only because of the mother's unique abilities and free will that she was able to give birth to such demons. Is this what is spreading across Thetis? And I quote, while most human broodmothers birth her locked darkspawn, the mother's unusual abilities and free will allow her to change her own offspring into horrors that merge insect-like bodies with a disturbingly human-looking face. What's more, if they are allowed to eat and grow, and if their number continues to multiply, they could become a horde as terrible as any blight. We know the Blight is back in some capacity. Creatures sharing the same demented facial creatures as the Red Templars. Darkspawn twisted even more so through Red Larium. Between the unnatural growth in the darkness and even Bioware's website naming this growth the Blight in their file name, both the Blight and these abominations will likely be immediate threats we must tackle in the game. But more on that later, we still have a few more slides to go. It's said that spirits don't only stick to possessing humanoids, but also may at times possess skeletons, trees, and more. We've seen this in Origins with many of the Sylvans, and I believe this is more of the same. But it's a spirit who took up a mountainside. I don't think a titan would be that small, and, and truly, I would not be surprised if we're actually looking at a different type of rock wraith. One that isn't absolutely warped by time, a demon, or red lyrium. We've covered most of these already, but the second to last one's a doozy. In this concept, we see a water monster which bears many similarities to a water creature called a cetus, yet combined with the chest of a centipede. A normal cetus is a rare water creature resembling kind of a hairy viper, capable of conducting electricity, similar to what we see here. Put a pin on this one, we're coming back to it. And the last concept art, we see a Lord of Fortune. Up until Deventer Nights, we have never seen this group mentioned by name before. Treasure hunters who search for glory and gold. The Lords of Fortune are known for using disguises and playing a role when necessary. While most of them don't live long in their field, the ones who do have been known to be a little bit more flamboyant in their earnings. Two are located in the BTS. One is the Sedatris in the corner of this Deventer shot seemingly drawing the attention of the caravan with the femme canari staring bullets into her. Then there's this man, with similar garb, treasure bag in hand, walking away from the burning ship. At first I thought he was simply a treasure hunter, but upon closer look, it's as if there's blood dripping from the bottom of the bag. A little sus, to be sure. Whether or not these two are part of our own companion pool, it's curious why this Ravani organization was brought out of nowhere. There is purpose here, we'll likely see in the next game. Now, what does this all mean? Bioware intends for these concept pieces to set the mood for the next Dragon Age, but not all of these elements will actually make it. However, based on what we've seen in Dragon Age Inquisition and all of the DLCs, the comics, the books, and Intimidator Knights, 
we can start to see the patterns that the developers have been slowly gravitating towards. The factions that we will interact with that bear importance and include the people that may become part of our own team, our new friends, and our new family. But at this stage, we can only make educated guesses, but that's why we're here, isn't it? The game we're working on now, we want to tell a story. What happens when you don't have power? When you don't have power, what do you need first? Resources and capital. It's known that Solus has agents all across Thetis, and working in the shadows is crucial to countering his efforts. The Crows thrive in shadow, using underhanded tactics to meet their goals. The Lords of Fortune have been known for using disguises in their heists. Companions or advisors from either faction would be valuable, let alone the opportunities made by either contract killings or treasure hunts. And as far as the Grey Wardens, uh, despite their troubled history and flimsy leadership within the past 20 years, they still hold power in Thetis. The right of conscription is extremely powerful, with the legal right to recruit anyone in their ranks. They train to be strong and skilled warriors, and we are facing something that looks too close to another blight. It's true that there are rumors of infighting within the organization. However, considering the Grey Wardens are the only ones capable of hearing the Archdemon's call, attuned to the call of the Taint and, by extension, the Red Lyrium infested with it, the Wardens are a risky, yet necessary asset. Honestly, I want to stress this even further. In times of the Blight, the Wardens are needed. In the last video, I mentioned the Blight and its return would threaten Thetis, while still stabilizing from the catastrophic events in Inquisition. We already know the hero of Ferelden, if left alive, ventured west to find a way out of the calling. In Dragon Age Origins, Avernus' experiments were on the path to figuring out how to extend one's life afflicted with the taint, and by Inquisition, we've seen that he has been successful in doing so. Isaia, Meryl, and Sandal all have experience isolating and separating the taint. It's proven that dragons also have a natural resistance to the blight, while in Last Flight, we know that wyverns still exist. All this potential, all these paths involving Grey Wardens and the Blight are diverging, and with the threat of a new Blight or something even more sinister, it is without a doubt they will be a key faction in all this mess. And with Bioware being so transparent about their hints here, from showing off what looks to be Wisehopped to sharing gameplay clearly, clearly from a player-controlled Grey Warden, I reckon we'll see much more of them in the game to come. Let me pose a question. Who is the antagonist of Dragon Age? Is it Solus? Is it the Canari? Or someone else? Some thing else? Let's start with the Canari. I don't figure them at all the main antagonists of the next game simply because they are suffering from their own infighting. The Yantam is already disobeying the Kune, and the Ben Hasrath are handling the investigations and killing off their own people for said disobedience. In between that and the fact that they're still boiling up their war with Tevinter, they have better things to do than deal with little old us. Then there's Solus. He's clearly dealing with a lot. While I do surmise he will be an absolute pain in your side the whole way through, his endeavor feels like the end game for an arc I don't believe we will complete in one game. Flemeth and Morgan grounded us in the past, helping us piece together lore in order to understand the present and figuratively passed on the baton to Solus. To subsequently deal with Solus in all of his efforts in one game, especially since everyone has a love-hate relationship with the guy, seems too fast, too quick. I'd question the future of Dragon Age with a move so drastic, unless DA4 were really that ridiculously long. It's clear that Solus has his own ambitions, and with a strong sense of self-sacrifice towards achieving his goals. In this short story callback, the manifestation of regret was fueled by Solus's regret, so strong that it took an entire company to destroy it. Towards the end of Trespasser, Solus was resolute in his path alone. In Tevinter Nights, he seems exhausted. He even sounds more tired than the original EA Play teaser long ago. You found me at last. I suspect you have questions. And in this behind the scenes, something rings different. Bitterness. Anger. Pride. They call me the Dread Wolf. What will they call you when this is over? Sure, Solus noted he's all about dropping the veil and undoing the world as you know it. 
His agents have been recovering and accumulating artifacts in a fashion that makes me think this is all a rat race towards a separate purpose that sees no resolution in sight. But a blight spares no one. Mathal recognized that danger, and surely, Solus sees it as well. No future exists when a blight endures. The blight corrupts everything it touches. Those who believe themselves capable of using it safely are mad. The pulsating sex and the children are easily the most worrisome things in this trailer. As I mentioned before, the children only come from a mother, and the first mother was a very unique case. The Cetus, the sex, the children. I believe there lies a parallel between these blighted sacks on the ground and the same horrors stemming from Hormac, from one of the short stories into Winter Nights. To make a long story short, one of the ascended elven gods, Gelanain, was known for creating creatures and beasts, but at the behest of the god that ascended her, Andril, most of her creations on land and sea were destroyed. The brackish pool we saw in Hormac mutated organics physically together, and much of what happened in the entirety of that story connects back to Gulanane as the source of this terrible magic. Now, consider what I said earlier about the mother. Her children are mutations of Darkspawn, and because of her, quote, unusual abilities and free will, that gave her the ability to willfully change her children to look the way they do. Inset like bodies with human-looking faces. The children are also free of the taint's call, but can and often choose to devote themselves to the mother. In Horrors of Hormac, the brackish pool mutated organics in a similar fashion, much like what the mother was capable of doing. They watched as a herlock walked toward the pool stiff-legged. It broke the surface of the gray ichor, which reacted instantly, flowing around the creature. In moments, it was completely submerged. Out of the murk rose a cocoon, iridescent and pulsing with a green light. There was a hissing sound, a flash of light, and the cocoon shattered. Yet what came out was not a herlock. It had the head of one, but that head rested on the body of a massive drake. While I don't believe Gulanane is directly behind the spread that had started on the surface, the processes they share are too identical to ignore. The children of the blood sacks are rooted in the dark spawn taint. The mother gives birth by manipulating her spawn into the form of the children. The Hormak pool seems to be a gas of Gilanen, which manipulates the form of those who enter its ichor and turns it into a new abomination that the gas wills. While the new form is conscious of its mother and her motivations, the will of the creature, or creatures in this instance, remains. The mother gives birth by manipulating her spawn into the form of the children. The children have their own will, but tend to follow the call of the mother. But now the father is gone. The mother can take her children deep into the earth and care for them, safe and sound. Gulanane's pool acts like the mother, and those who touch its ichor are physically manipulated into a new abomination. They have their own will, but are compelled by the pool's gas to follow the will of Gilanane. Or perhaps, it's the mother's nature and magic that borrows from Gilanane. Two halves, two holes, trying to be two ones. But I stayed me, and it hates that. She cannot have it, not again, locked for a reason. During Inquisition, Solus has a very brief conversation with Vivian that, at the moment, I hadn't given a second thought. But the more I read into Gulanen and Andrew, my suspicion grows. We'll leave this for a future video, but in the meantime, here's some food for thought. Corypheus is a complex creature to draw upon so many different sources of power. He has his own magic. He draws from the Blight, the artifact he carries is Elven, and now he uses a demon to create a false calling to fool the mages. The false calling was Blight magic. The demon merely amplified its power. This ancient magister is like a man drinking from three wine glasses at once. And one of the glasses is poisoned. If out of all of this I had to give you only one theory, it would be this. Based on what we have seen, the books, the trailers, the Blight, Whoever is behind the resurfacing of the blight on the surface is a new mother. The true antagonist we will see in the next game.
Then again, it's all just a theory. We'll find out more in the next reveal. Is this the Dragon Age you want? Is this the Dragon Age we need? Is there anything you saw that I may have missed? Let me know in the comments section below. My name is Ash, and thank you for watching this analysis of behind the scenes, the next Dragon Age. <laughs> if you enjoyed, please press the like button to let YouTube's algorithm know that this is worth sharing with the rest of the world. And subscribe if you want to see more. Until next time, it was nice talking with you. Take care, and fin and ansal.